always our community has always gone ahead and and played a leading role and we have um uh, and we feel similarly now that we have a, a role to play in the resettlement of, of, of Afghani refugees in the greater Washington region. So today we have with us Naomi Steinberg, who is the vice president and of policy and advocacy at HIAS, and also Kristen Peck, who's the CEO of Lutheran Social Services of the nation's capital. Naomi, we'll start with Naomi, and we'll ask Naomi to please give us maybe a five or 10 minute overview about what's going on. Then we will ask Kristen, to, um, who again is the CEO of Lutheran Social Services, to give us a local view, a regional view of what's going on. Um, uh, Lutheran Social Services of the nation's capital is the lead agency throughout the Washington region uh, that is responsible for settling these refugees, and therefore we are working directly with them. The purpose of this call, after we've been, uh, is after Naomi has spoken and Kristen has spoken, then we're going to have a Q and A session, which we'll ask you to please put your questions and answers in the chat, and then Vicky. Who is my? Who is our director of Virginia um, Government and Community Relations? Just raise your hand, Vicky. Thanks. And um, Deborah Miller, who's our director of Maryland Com Community and Government Relations. Vicky also covers uh, government relations and community relations for DC as well. Um, they will be looking for questions, and we will ask the questions that you pose in the uh, chat box if we're not able to figure out this video and mute um, thing that's going on right now. And then at the end of this call. If you think that the Jewish community would benefit from another call where we would, could collaborate in terms of how we can work with each other on this effort, we're happy to do so. Because we know that some synagogues are going to simply do what they wish to do and they do well. And some of you may want to participate in some sort of a communal effort. But we are, the JCRC is, of course, is always open and available for any of those things. So if you're interested in having a communal gathering, in other words, another call like this to organize among themselves, please let Debbie or Vicky know. You have their email address and we will be happy to put that together very quickly. So I'm going to stop now. Turn to Naomi, if you can speak for 10 minutes or so about what's going on nationally. Kristen, if you could please then talk for about 10 minutes about what's going on, and then we'll have Q&A. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us um, in such a quick uh, in such a um, uh, quick fashion. And um, please, Naomi. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for including Hyas in this. It's been one of those days, it's just been so hectic, and I just feel really calm to be with all of you, to be with my neighbors. Um, right now, it just feels like speaking with but fellow community members feels really good. So, so I really appreciate this opportunity. So as Ryan said, what I'm gonna do is give you a big picture um, from 3000 foot view about what is going on. Not so much exciting what's going on in the news because we're all watching the same things. You know, I've had CNN on for a week and a half. I know you all have too. We're reading the same articles. So what I want to do is explain how highest is perceiving what is going on and what our priorities are from a humanitarian and refugee protection perspective. I'm of course biased in that I'm in charge of our advocacy department. So I'm going to focus on the advocacy piece of this, but I'm also going to, when we end, talk about other things that you can do, which I think will be a nice transition to Kristen because she she is at the, the focal point of what's happening in the local area. So I think, I think she's going to be the person who has a lot of the answers for many of your questions. But for us, like so many of you, our priority right now is how to get people out of Afghanistan who need to get out. We're all watching the calendar pages flip by with this August 31st deadline, and we have some real concerns that I know many of you share. Here are our top asks, therefore. We are asking that President Biden, first of all, even before we get to the evacuations, he should immediately appoint a special presidential envoy for Afghan humanitarian and refugee issues. We fully understand that his administration is being pulled in multiple directions in response to this Afghanistan um, situation, but we need to see a real commitment from him that there is a long-term commitment from the administration to make sure that humanitarian and refugee issues are not shunted to the side. So one way that he could do that is to appoint a special presidential envoy. He is going to be getting a lot of pressure from many of us about that. But for the evacuations, we, have real concerns about the looming deadline. And our main ask is that the evacuations have to continue for as long as necessary to ensure that the most at-risk Afghans have access to safety. Now, we're not naive enough to think that any resettlement country can resettle, you know, the potentially millions of people from Afghanistan right now who are in danger. 
but there is a way to help the most vulnerable in the short term. So we want to make sure that evacuation flights continue um, and that those who are eligible for special immigrant visas, SIVs, I'm sure you've all seen that acronym recently. And in short, those are people who were affiliated in some way with the US mission or a NATO mission over the last um, two decades and their families. We need to get them all out, full stop. But also we think that those who are now eligible for what we in the refugee community call P2. The Biden administration announced several weeks ago that there's a new category for refugee admissions. And that is for those who um, also worked in some way with the United States, whether it was with a US funded non-governmental organization or a media entity, they need to have access to evacuation as well. But we've heard a lot of people talking about that, which is really, really good. But we need more people to talk about, I think, are the other people who need to have access to safety, including human rights activists, especially women and girls, members of the LGBTQ plus community, journalists, and religious and ethnic minorities. And while it's impossible to prioritize who is more at risk than others, for us at highest, obviously, because of the face of us being a faith-based organization, one of our priorities is, the, or are, I guess I should say, the religious minorities, which is why we are really pushing for the State Department to expand um, what expand its group processing, essentially, to streamline refugee admissions for Afghan religious minorities. And that includes Sikhs and Hindus and Christians and Christian converts and Shia Muslims, because these are communities that were hanging on by a thread before the Taliban took over again. And now we have been in touch with, with those in the Sikh and Hindu community who are working with their, with their community members overseas. And these individuals really feel like the targets are on their back, that they are living on borrowed time. So that's one of Hayes's priorities. Now, when we talk about the evacuations, we need to get down to some brass tacks because what we know is that getting to the airport in Kabul is, is a gauntlet that none of us would ever want to go through. So what we're also asking of the Biden administration is we are urging them to work with ally governments and also with the United Nations to make sure that what, that what we call humanitarian corridor, humanitarian corridors exist so that people can safely get to the airport. Because otherwise, all this talk about evacuations means nothing if people can't get through Kabul. But also, we know eventually the airport is going to be completely off limits. That is just going to happen. So we need to make sure that neighboring countries, primarily Pakistan and Iran, allow Afghan refugees to enter their territories. We know that some people are able to make it across, but we need that to be official and we need them to be welcomed into these other countries. Um, also, as, we are, as you know, we are one of the nine national refugee resettlement agencies. And so we have a real concern about the refugee resettlement program, as I know many of you do too. And this conversation and this humanitarian crisis is actually happening at an interesting time because we are on the cusp of President Biden announcing how many refugees can be admitted in the next fiscal year, which starts on October 1. He has to make that announcement sometime between now and the end of September. Previously, he promised that it would be at least 125,000, which at the time for us, we were, you know, metaphorically speaking, dancing in the streets, although that was never official yet. We still needed to see that. But now we think that needs to go up because of this crisis, that we have to be able to rescue as many Afghans as possible, but not at the expense of refugees coming from other parts of the world. We need to be able to do both. Um, and so I think, I think that is it for us in terms of our top advocacy asks. But what Hayes is asking, because we're getting so many questions which we are so appreciative of about what can we do? What can we do? And so the first thing is, I would say you should advocate. As soon as I'm done talking, I'm going to drop into the chat box a link from the highest website about exactly how to do that. And we're gonna be updating this very regularly, including updating our asks, updating our talking points. Also, the volunteer part is huge. And I'm so glad Kristen is on because because as was said, it's her organization that is really doing the heavy lifting to actually welcome Afghans coming in to our local communities. And so the volunteer options she will talk about, there's, there's so many possibilities. And so 
that's a key thing to do as well. And then at the risk of sounding crass, donating is also important too. Donate to organizations like Kristen's, donate to organizations like HIAS that are doing the advocacy and helping our network around the country welcome Afghans just as Kristen is. And also I'm gonna do a little plug. Literally as we speak, we are finalizing a letter that will be sent to Jewish organizations and congregations, national, state, and local. And that letter outlines some of our top asks for President Biden. And we're gonna be looking to get as many signatures as possible on it very quickly, because we want President Biden to know that the American Jewish community has our eyes on him on this. And so you can look for that in your inboxes, either still this evening or first thing tomorrow morning. And with that, I will stop. So Naomi, let me ask you a quick question. Are you going to be looking for, for Jewish organizations to sign on to that letter? So yeah, Jewish organizations, not individuals. But okay. so, so, yeah. so when we get that letter, we will make it a point to distribute it throughout greater Washington. Yep. And yep. also we will work with JCPA, which is the umbrella of yep. all CRC so that we can get our colleagues around the country to get all the synagogues in their community. So let's, we'll put that down. We'll take a roll on that. And we'll be happy That's to wonderful. Like that because there's at least 150 organizations, if not more, um, in this community that would sign on. Um, what about the interfaith, non-Jews, non-Jewish organizations? Yeah, just so focusing is, on the Jewish community. Yeah, so our, our letter is specifically for the Jewish community because the, um, the Interfaith Immigration Coalition is circulating an interfaith letter now. If you haven't seen that, I'll go ahead and put that in the, in the chat box also. Its language is a little bit different than ours, but um, if, if people are interested in signing onto a, an interfaith letter as well, you should, you should. So I can send that link as well. Okay, if you would send to us, to Vicki, myself, and Debbie, um, the letter that you want us to send out to have other organizations, to encourage other Jewish organizations to sign, we'd be happy to. And also a list of the ask, because as long as we're sending it out to all the synagogues and, the con and all the other institutions in our community, we can also ask them to put it on their Facebook sites for any individual advocacy that we need. So yeah. in, the same, in the same communication, we can work for organization of institutions, we can organization of institutes them of volunteer of um, of individual signatures. So we'd be happy to facilitate that. It's actually okay. Our, thank you so pleasure. much for that. Yeah, for thank you pleasure. so much for that. Thank you, thank you, Naomi. Great, of for course. You. Very appreciative. Uh, Kristen, we'll take it from here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ron, for inviting me, and to all of you for tuning in this evening. And good to see you again, Naomi. I really appreciate that. Um, that in that introduction on how we can all advocate. Um, LSS NCA has been serving refugees and immigrants since right after World War II. And so that's been a longstanding commitment of ours. Uh, we've been serving Afghan special immigrant visa holders since the US created that visa category about 20 years ago. And we have about um, 20 Afghan SIV holders on our team who are on the front lines welcoming Afghan allies right now. And so when we were approached by our funder, which is one of the nine national agencies, um, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service at the end of July, um, uh, LARS asked us, are you ready to welcome Afghan allies? And it was a no brainer for us. Um, of, of course we are, you know, this is part of our mission as it is all of yours. And we like you, um, you know, were concerned about the evacuation of our allies and that's only escalated as we've seen the situation in Afghanistan um, escalate. Um, I, I wanna give some context and this is uh, alluding to what uh, Naomi mentioned about the, the, the US resettlement program. Um, you know, just to give you context, in the last year of the Obama administration, LSS NCA served about 1500 refugees and immigrants that year. Um, and then when the the, the, the next administration, the Trump administration had more um, restrictive policies and they downscaled the program, we were serving about 500 refugees a year. So there was a significant downscaling of our programmatic efforts. Um, when we got the call in July to start expecting SIV holders um, and, and evacuees, Afghan evacuees, we, we said yes, um, but we had not yet received the funding for this coming fiscal year starting October 1st when we expect um, uh, the, the number of refugees to increase to the 125K that Biden's committed to. So um, we said, yes, we're ready to do this.
but we had our team here who was used to resettling about 500 people a year. Um, I'm expecting if the pace continues, which we expect it to, to serve about 1,000 um, Afghan evacuees by the end of September. So this has been a very significant scaling up for us. And it's something that um, everyone on our team, it's an all hands on deck approach. We have staff from every department pitching in, doing what we can to make sure we are providing the best possible services to our allies because they deserve that and they need that. Um, someone that we, one of the, the people we've served recently, um, she was working for a defense contractor in Afghanistan. She was providing human resources services um, and she was being followed by the Taliban and um, was receiving threatening voicemails. She and her husband made it on a plane um, that Friday, the weekend that the airport shut down um, and was taken over by the Taliban. So she narrowly left, narrowly escaped and was sharing with me um, her fears for her family who's still there and for other women and girls. Um, she said, you know, it's, it, it feels like we're going back in time 20 years. So um, I don't have to underscore the need for this call and the need for the work we're all doing. I know you know that, but um, do want you to know that that it, it you know the that is an example of the, the people who we are serving. And so just for context, um, we're receiving we're receiving about eighty referrals um, a week of individuals. They are coming into our office. Um, as as I mentioned, we had staffing to support about five hundred people a year. So we are trying to hire people as quickly as possible. Um, that takes time. We um, require background checks because we're working with human beings and all that whole process, the recruitment, the hiring, um, the background checks takes time. So in the meantime and, and, and continuing even after we're fully staffed, we need volunteers. We are so dependent on volunteers to do this work. We can't do it without volunteers. We have volunteers in our office doing everything from delivering um, checks to clients, to taking clients grocery shopping. Um, we have uh, volunteers who are sitting down with clients and helping them apply for long-term housing. We have volunteers who are helping us manage um, a housing lead spreadsheet. Housing is just such a critical need um, in this area. And so we're looking both at short-term and long-term options. Short-term, where um, we, we did get a, a generous donation uh, from Airbnb. So we're using Airbnb we're also relying on hotel suites sometimes. Um, and then long-term, um, we're, we're always trying to find landlords who are um, interested and willing to, to rent to um, the Afghan allies. And so um, we, this is an effort that we would not be able to do if we didn't have the support of our community partners. We have longstanding partnerships um, with congregations, um, with the Jewish community, with the Afghan community, really with multi-faith, multi-ethnic um, communities. And so um, you, some of you may have worked with us before on a home setup for a refugee apartment. Um, you may be familiar with our Good Neighbor program, our Good Neighbor Partner program, which um, there are different levels of sponsorship for refugee families. These are all areas we're activating right now. Um, to give you some context on uh, you know, why we depend so heavily on the need of volunteers and community groups and multi-faith coalitions, the funding we get from the State Department to resettle refugees provides us with $1,220 for 90 days um, for, uh, per, per adult. And so um, as, as you all know, the housing prices in um, this area are quite expensive and that's frankly where most of our, the client money goes. And so if we don't have donations for things like, um, um, you know, house, housing supplies, furniture, um, gift cards to grocery stores, um, we also accept just monetary donations. Without those donations, um, we wouldn't be able to stretch those, those monies. We try when we can to support the rent for our, for our clients for um, six months. Um, that is not possible um, through the funding we get from the State Department. And so although this is a uh, government funded program, it uh, requires a public private partnership. And one more thing I'm gonna note in terms of the need, um, because many of the people who are now coming in will be paroled in order to expedite the process, um, those persons will not be eligible as of now, um, this may change, <laughs> 
but from my understanding right now, for benefits through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And it is those benefits that really also help us stretch our dollars. And so we are expecting a flow of both those who are eligible and both those who are not. And so it just, it really underscores the need for a really strong community response to show our allies um, that, that we welcome them and we care. Um, if you go to our website, which is lssnca.org, we have a yellow ticker at the top of the, the webpage. If you click on that, there is a webpage of, about Operation Welcome Afghan Allies. Um, and it tells you, it we have a running ticker of how many people we're serving, how many volunteers we have, how many donations we've received. And then there are five ways to get involved. And so the five ways we have um, include donations. Again, a gift of any size is welcome and allows us to provide immediate assistance to arriving families. So I'll just give you a quick example of how we've been able to use those donations. We're able to have petty cash at our offices, um, which we wouldn't be able to have without those donations. So if a client comes into our door, as soon as they come into our door and before they're eligible for food stamps and such, we can directly give them cash to help go grocery shopping. Um, so that's a, that's a really clear example of something that's been a, a great help for our case management staff to be able to have that petty cash on hand. Um, we also, of course, are looking for people um, to uh, volunteer. We have multiple ways to volunteer. We have a volunteer interest form on our website. Um, things we need help uh, from, from, from volunteers are transportation, setting up apartments, assembling and collecting welcome home gift boxes. Uh, we do have an interest form on our website. Um, and we're also uh, really engaging the Afghan community as well. We're looking for, um, for volunteers to be um, assigned to, uh, to cases so that they can help support the case manager. And we're, we're looking for um, volunteers also to help do things like um, mentor, uh, children, uh, provide mentorship to children or, or even adults as they're um, preparing for job interviews. Um, and then another, another thing that you could do is start a fundraiser. Um, that's something um, that, that you can do within your own networks, your own contacts. Um, and and that, that's a way where you can really ma maximize those donations. And then of course, as Naomi mentioned already, advocating is another way that you can help. Um, I'll just quickly list the biggest needs we've seen for our allies so far. It's, it's transportation, food and housing. Those are the most critical needs we're seeing at this point. But I, I do wanna mention that much like um, a natural disaster where there's a, a big swarming of support in the immediate, and then um, once the attention, the media attention subsides, um, it, it seems that, that that attention goes away and then the, the, you know, you're left with rebuilding. I, I wanna plug this as, um, you know, this is really a marathon and not a sprint. Um, we want to ensure that our allies have longstanding relationships in their new neighborhoods, that they have um, networks to be connected to, um, and that this effort of welcoming, welcoming our allies extends beyond this, this immediate surge right now. And so um, if you're interested in getting involved, um, and if like right now is not the right time, but a month from now is the right time, that's perfectly fine too. We, need, we will need you then, and we'll need you three months from now, and we'll need you six months from now. So um, you know, this is a, a sustained effort. Um, and again, we, I'm just very grateful for your interest in partnering with us and for your support. Um, and I will open it up for questions or turn it over to Ron to do so. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and you should know that um, our hearts are with you as you undertake this extraordinary humanitarian mission and the Jewish community will be there with you. And Naomi, the Jewish community will be there with you in this region as we advocate nationally for what we do. We take this as a moral imperative. Um, Vicki Fishman, who is again, our director of Virginia government relations has been um, receiving has received several phone has received several chats uh, that have been sent to questions that have been sent directly to her and I see some are beginning to fill in. So Vicki, would you like to take it from here and pose them to either of uh, to either Kristen or Naomi? Absolutely. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Okay. Um, so 
Um, there's one question about whether you are, oh, I just lost it. I was looking at it and then it scrolled down. Um, whether, whether there is a subgroup of um, Lutheran social services that is focused on career counseling um, and that sort of assistance. We do um, job training and placement. Um, if you're interested in bringing together a group for um, career counseling, we've, we would love to, to engage you in that. Um, I love these kinds of questions where groups are proposing ideas to us. And then, um, yes, we, we would love that. That's a great idea. And, and, and we would um, work alongside you and, and help um, connect uh, groups to, to families who need that type of career counseling, working alongside our job developers. Is that the kind of thing that you expect to need immediately, or is that something that's longer term? I mean, obviously it's long term, but is it long term in the sense that like we don't even need to be thinking about it for another month, two months, or is it something that you actually are, are starting to worry about it and think about now? That's a great question too. We are worrying about it now. So the State Department does expect um, self-sufficiency within three months, which is pretty aggressive. And our clients are really worried about their own financial sustainability and that of their families back home. And so um, despite the trauma they're experiencing and the concern and the fear about what's happening, that's often the first question they're asking us, frankly. It's, it's um, can, you, can we start applying for jobs now? Great. Um, do you have a sense right now of how many of the refugees are gonna remain in the DC area? That's a good question. I know we are expecting to serve, um, and, and this, I'll just let you know, this number rapidly changes. So I can tell you this now, it might look very different tomorrow. But right now, my understanding is that LSSNCA will be serving a thousand Afghan allies by the end of September. And everyone we serve um, is, we're referred those cases because they are staying in the DC metro area and are in, primarily in Northern Virginia. And can you speak a little bit to how the COVID, uh, particularly the Delta strain and all that is impacting how, how this is playing out? That's a good question. Um, so we do require um, our, our team to wear masks. We require our team to be vaccinated um, we, or have a negative COVID test if, if they have a reasonable accommodation. Um, and we Let's see, you know, we are taking precautions, but we're also, um, you know, I think this is an effort that needs to happen in, in person in large part. Um, uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot lost when that, sometimes when that happens virtually, especially the level of trauma and the comprehensive needs we're seeing in our current clients. However, there still are a lot of ways for volunteers to be involved virtually. So if that is a concern, um, there are so many ways to be involved. This is an administrative strain on us. We, um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're serving um, twice the amount of people that we served last year in two months. And so um, we have volunteers helping with all types of back end paperwork type things um, from their own homes um, on shared Excel spreadsheets and such. And so there are a lot of ways to get involved. We, um, mentoring is still virtual. Um, donating, of course, is virtual. Sending um, us uh, Amazon. We have Amazon wish lists for clients. Doing that is virtual. So there's plenty of ways to engage virtually. Um, and then if it is in person, um, you know, we commit to our staff being masked and vaccinated. Kristen, can I just ask one question? Is there any um, any group with certain professional skills? Do you need attorneys? Do you need um, is there any specific, because the Jewish community has often been very helpful in the past, able to mobilize pro bono legal assistance, for example. Are there any, I mean, yes. professional <laughs> skills or um, that you need, medical, I mean, any, anything along those lines, the professional, I mean, obviously there's plenty of things, obviously, for all of us to do. Um, we don't have a specific skill set as a, as a doctor or a lawyer, but, um, and, and, th and that information is available. So two questions. One, do you have any professional skills that, that you're especially looking for? And two, how is the best way for either congregations or volunteers uh, individually to embrace you? And I see Naomi has her hand up also on the screen to speak. So, and then we can go back to questions because I think those are on people's minds is my guess. Naomi, Naomi did you want to go first? You're on the mute. Okay. No, you should. I was just getting pushy because I want to go speak after you because um, I, I have an answer too, but you should go, you should go first. 
Okay. Um, so one thing that's emerging, attorneys, yes, I think um, a, a, having attorneys is always really helpful to have a, a, a network of attorneys. So, so yes. Um, another two other things we're working on right now is setting up, um, I, I think probably in the parking lot of our office, if, our, if the church that we uh, rent from will allow us to, um, a, uh, a health clinic and a, a school enrollment clinic. And so that would be that we would need to staff that with, um, you know, volunteer physicians assistants. Um, so that would be one skill set. Um, and then it would be helpful for, you know, it could be any volunteer, but it would be helpful for persons who are um, in the school system to, to help with the school enrollment, because sometimes that can be really tricky. Um, so those are two skill sets that I'm, I'm just come to mind as an immediate need that would help us solve a case management issue where we have such a high volume. So we're looking at setting up just in our parking lot that, you know, kind of having a one-stop shop. The client comes here, they meet with their case manager, they go shopping amongst their in-kind donations, and then they're able to get their health screening in the parking lot and enroll their kids in, in school. Um, the best way to get involved, we have a volunteer interest form on our website. I'll shoot the link in the, um, the chat. Um, if you are getting together a group, um, you can fill out the volunteer interest form as a group. And then if you could just email me and let me let me know you did that, and then I can see if I can um, you know pull that out and prioritize that. Um, and I was just going to add to that when you when you asked about attorneys, even though Highest does not resettle in the DMV area, like like Kristen's organization does, we do have, and many of you might actually already be part of this. The attorneys on the call, we do have a vast pro bono attorney network, and we are. We are figuring out the best way to to um, to activate them now because the legal needs with these incoming individuals are going to be significant, primarily because the status that many of them are going to be coming in on requires that they will need to adjust their immigration status. And that is not an easy process for anybody. So if you are already part of Pius's pro bono network, stay tuned. You will likely be getting, you will likely be getting some emails from us. And if you are not, but you would like to be, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat as well. And you can, you can be in touch with Hyas to see how you can get started with that. Great. So I, I have a couple questions that are about funding in general. Um, one is, Kristen, you mentioned um, petty cash, but there's a question of whether there's a place to just be donating gift cards from the various grocery stores, stores, which is maybe easier to manage. And then as long as we're talking about funding, the other question is on a more global level. You mentioned the federal funding. Are you also getting funding from local and state uh, state governments? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. We do get funding from local and state government. Um, it's It still does not cover the need, but we, we do get funding from um, Maryland and Virginia. Um, from their um, offices of, for new Americans. Um, gift cards are always welcome. Uh, uh, Target, Walmart, Giant, um, grocery stores and, and other places where um, allies can shop um, that, are, that, that have a presence in Northern Virginia um, would, would be really welcome. And um, so you mentioned that most of the people coming through your services will be in Northern Virginia or in Virginia. Um, for the people on the call who are in Maryland, is there another entity that's handling this in Maryland and that, that, that they would be better being in touch with? Sure. So we serve clients um, in Hyattsville. So we have a Hyattsville office, um, Fairfax um, and Dale City. Um, and then there are also... Um, uh, International Rescue Committee um, is is in uh, Maryland, as is ECDC. What, what was the second one you said? Um, ECDC. ECDC. Okay. What does that stand for? Uh, Ethiopian Community Development Center. Great. Um, Excuse so me, so Kristen. Can I ask a question? Something that you brought up that I think people might be very interested in is the Good Neighbor Partner Program. Mm -hmm. You could elaborate on that a little bit. Is I know we have um, a tremendous amount of social action chairs um, who are tremendous uh, on this call, and a lot of them have worked before um, uh, helping families. Um, uh, and, and I was wondering how that partner, how that partnership works and how that program works. Absolutely. Do you mind if I share my screen for a second? No, 
Do you, okay. does it look like it's letting you or do I need to? Uh, nope, I got it. I think this might be a helpful visual. I'm sharing the right thing, right? You can see these three levels. Yep. Okay, I'll put the link to where I am in the chat. Um, so we have this good neighbor partner program. We do have this stacked with um, folks who would provide training to our good neighbor partners and walk alongside them along the way. So we do provide support for this. And so we have different levels of commitment based on ability. Um, so the, the level three commitment, um, that would be the, the lightest touch, um, would be planning donation drives, um, collecting furnishings, furnishings and household supplies for a new arrival, and then setting up the apartment for a family's arrival. So these are really home setups, quick home setups, setups for when a family first arrives. Um, we would provide you with information on the family composition. Um, you know, we would, right, right now we're receiving a lot of in-kind donations. So you could shop our in-kind donations to help um, set up the home. Um, and so that would be really setting up that, that first home for the family. The level two is a six month commitment. Um, so that would include both um, setting up the home and then providing adjustment and support um, for the first 90 days. Um, and in, including transportation to and from appointments. Um, and then this one would actually cover, um, require a cost, um, a, a cost of 250. Um, and then level three would be a year commitment. So this would be the, um, the, the more um, in, intense involvement, engagement. And so this would again be uh, the levels three or two and three um, and then also providing rental assistance um, for three months and then partial assistance for um, uh, uh, another six months. So these are the different levels of engagement. Um, I will um, exit out of my share um, and send you um, the link for how to express interest in becoming a good neighbor partner. I think I might have my colleague Shelby on the line too. Um, who, if there are further questions about that, Shelby, I'm gonna defer to you to answer them. I will, uh, if we get more questions about that, I will I will find her or I'll, maybe Deb, maybe you can find her in the list of attendees. Deb, are you able to do that? I think she's working on that. Um, so I had another question, um, I guess one question actually about that. So that's something, those levels are something that a congregation as a whole would sign up to to make that commitment. Is that how that works? That's right. We also okay. um, really uh, we've seen a lot of really neat and creative different ways of going about this. So it could be a congregation. It could be a whole multi faith coalition. Um, and you know, I I think what I would encourage you is to think big um, because the the families um, may have a lot of needs. And I think the more the more the merrier that you have in your groups as, as to not um, is to not tax any one, any one group. Um, so Shelby just texted me, by the way, and said, I'm not able to unmute, but she is on the line. So I'll have her text me if I need answers from her specifically about GNP because okay. she manages that. Great. Um, so I have a couple of questions about space. Um, one is the um, office space. Like there's some, somebody commented on the open office space in this area right now. And is that something that you're able to capitalize on? Um, and then the second question about space is a little closer to home. Um, wondering where do you operate out of? Um, because are you on Little River Turnpike? Because if so, you are right next to our JCC. That yeah, would be we are. Happy we share like a parking space. lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are in the basement of Bethlehem Lutheran Church. I mean, we don't share a parking lot, but we 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 almost do. I mean, we I could like put my hand across the parking lot practically <laughs> and touch the JCC. So we're very close. Um, we, we are definitely outgrowing our space. Um, and so there, we are looking at additional space. Um, we're waiting to see if some of our grants come through for next fiscal year to see if, if that might be an option for us. Um, I think we would still have a presence in this space for, um, some of our programs, but, um, you know, we are, we are definitely maxing out in space. So um, Jeff Danik, who is on this call, is your neighbor, and uh, I will make sure that you have each other's uh, emails when, when we're done so that you can talk about space. Um, Excellent. Um, Shelby, I'm wondering if you could respond to the chat. There's a question about where we stand 
in terms of contacting congregations who have signed up for the Good Neighbor program. So I'll have Shelby respond to that in the chat. Can you tell me what her, um, what, what name is she under? Because I'm having a hard time finding her in the list. Is she, is she there as Shelby or is she there with her last name? Let me look. She might be under LSS NCA Zoom, if you see that. Yep, I do. All right. That is Shelby. Um, she should be able to unmute. Oh, I, yep, it works now. Hi. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so we currently have the interest form on our website for uh, groups and congregations uh, and communities to sign up for um, uh, both the level three home setup um, as well as the level one and level two. Um, so those are two separate forms at the moment. Um, so at the moment we are contacting uh, groups um, on a rolling basis to do uh, home setups for newly arriving uh, Afghan refugee families. And um, we are going to be transitioning to uh, training and onboarding those interested uh, level one and level two groups um, in, in the kind of this next phase of the next couple of weeks. Um, so we're, we're kind of emphasizing home setups at the moment, um, but then um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be really uh, uh, leaning on um, groups who are interested in that longer term support of six months and a year of uh, refugee co-sponsorship. Um, so, and I, as long as you're there, Shelby, there's another question about the Good Neighbor program, which is um, fam people who are in Montgomery County or Prince George's County, are they able to participate in the Good, no the Good Neighbor program through Lutheran Social Services, or would they have to go through one of the other agencies that's there, that, that's in those locations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we are definitely welcome uh, to, we, we welcome, you know, uh, groups from Mont Montgomery County, from Prince George's. Um, a lot of our clients in Maryland live in Prince George's. Um, so in terms of proximity, uh, I think that's, you know, would be a great fit. Um, for, for folks in Montgomery County, it might be a little bit of a drive to, to, um, to you know, uh, interact with the family. Um, you know, it might be like a 30 minute drive um, if folks are interested in that. But as we're kind of um, living in a virtual and hybrid world, especially for um, our refugee mentoring as part of the Good Neighbor Partner Program, um, you know, we, uh, we would definitely encourage any, any groups to kind of sign up um, and, and we would be really mindful about placement to try to uh, uh, find refugee families who are, are as close as possible to the group, um, depending on where they live. So I have a couple of questions about kids actually on both sides of the relationship. One is um, to what extent are you expecting unaccompanied minors? And then the other is on the volunteer side, to what extent do you have opportunities for teens to be, be helpful volunteers? I'll take the first and Shelby, I'll pick you the second, if that's okay. Yeah. Shelby, okay. I can turn on your camera if that's okay. So uh, that's, a, that's actually okay. I'll, I'll just okay. stay, I'll stay behind the scenes. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so for the first question, um, we are not expecting a large number of unaccompanied children in this flow. Um, we, we may get some, but that's, um, we've been in conversation with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, and, and as of this point, and again, information changes rapidly, but we're, that's not what we're expecting right now. However, we are always recruiting foster parents for unaccompanied refugee minor program. We always need foster parents. We have um, the, the the um, countries of origin we're seeing for this population right now are um, Central American countries, uh, uh, Congolese, Eritrean, um, Burmese. So some of, those are some of the countries from which we're receiving unaccompanied children. Uh, and then to address uh, the question about volunteering. Uh, so yes, we do have opportunities for high school students to volunteer. Um, last year during COVID, we actually launched a virtual uh, tutoring program for um, refugee youth uh, K through 12. And that was a way for um, high schoolers to, um, to tutor uh, 
other youth um, in ESL and homework, homework support um, and kind of subject-based tutoring uh, along, alongside their, their parents. So um, that was a, a successful program and we're, we're planning to continue that um, through this year. Um, in addition, we, um, you know, as part of our refugee family mentoring program, um, you know, these, these, fam these refugee families um, tend to have kids K through 12. So, you know, we encourage kind of a, a family approach to, to refugee family mentoring. So, um, for example, if there were, um, if there was a two, one or two adult volunteers that signed up for refugee family mentoring, um, they would be more than welcome to engage their, their kids as well in um, meeting the family, um, getting to know the other kids, um, you know, whether that was through, um, you know, informal tutoring uh, or just, you know, learning their, their new neighborhood. Um, in addition, uh, as we are, um, you know, just really encouraging service projects and, you know, uh, continuing to receive donations at our office, um, we will be opening up several opportunities for um, high schoolers to, to get involved in person, um, whether that's organizing donations um, at our office or in our storage, um, as well as um, helping kind of support, for example, the, the clinic that Kristen mentioned earlier. So um, we will be continuing to, to post these opportunities on our website. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um Shelby, can I ask you to answer one other question I, I just got in the chat? Yeah. Um, just because I know this has been evolving constantly. Um, so at one point, we were really interested in folks who had a spare room in their home as a temporary housing situation. And so there's, a, there's an ask about that. Um, Shelby, can you say more about where we are now with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did post the homestay interest form on our website, um, I believe two weeks ago, um, with the intention of um, trying to kind of quickly set up a homestay program uh, where uh, families could temporarily live, yeah, in a, in a couple of rooms in a family's home, um, and just in the short term as we look for permanent housing. Um, we have uh, since just in, in uh, interacting with our clients and meeting our, our new families, um, as well as uh, seeking advice from the Afghan community in, in the area, um, we have decided to, um, to be a little bit more narrow in, um, in the selection process for um, homestays. Um, we're currently working on a vetting process for homestay families, but just in, uh, based on cultural preferences of, of this population, um, we are, are going to be kind of emphasizing uh, homestays that will have a separate apartment um, that is kind of an independent dwelling unit uh, that will have, you know, its own private kitchen, private bathroom, um, just for uh, privacy and cultural reasons. So we are still trying to stand up that homestay uh, program, and we're going to keep the community updated on that. Um, but kind of alongside of that, we are really uh, exploring other short-term housing options um, in the meantime. So, yeah. So I have a, a couple last questions that I'm going to group together so that we can be mindful of everybody's time. Um, and they sort of go together. One is if you could just talk a little bit about in-kind donations. How does that work? If people have furniture, you know, is there a drop-off place or, or, or does it need to be coordinated ahead of time? Talk a little bit about that. Um, and then there was a question, a couple questions about the um, tutoring program, assuming that it would involve some kind of technology. Um, do the people, you know, do you have access or is that another thing that you need donated as technology so that kids can be connected to mentors uh, and whatnot in this virtual world we live in? Yeah, yeah. And I can I can speak to those too. Um, and Kristen, feel free to jump in. But um, for the for donations, um, so uh, previously, we have always accepted furniture donations for uh, refugee families. Um, and we have uh, you know, a few storage units that we, we keep furniture in from, from folks in the community. 
And we have a team of what we call muscle movers <laughs> who um, you know, use their, their vehicles uh, to transport furniture to families' homes. Um, just due to the sheer number of um, uh, families that we are receiving, we have pivoted to really leaning on the, home, the level three home setup, uh, good neighbor partners who can mobilize quickly and who can set up, who can you know, work with their team to set up a family's home using whether you know, donated furniture in their network or purchasing furniture um, to be delivered to that family's home. Uh, and really, you know, taking on the task of organizing um, uh, the furniture required as part of the home setup uh, and, and supplies as well. Um, so we are at the moment actually pausing our furniture, um, like receiving furniture from the community. Um, but we do have community partners such as Community Forklift and Homes Not Borders and um, uh, a wider circle uh, who are... Uh, really not only receiving furniture and then helping supplement home setups for us, um, but also, you know, just we're, yeah, we're, we're it's kind of this, it's this whole system, but we're, um, we're kind of pausing our furniture at the moment, um, might open it up back in the next couple of weeks, depending on how the situation goes. Um, in terms of in-kind donations, smaller supplies, we have um, kind of the urgent needs for our families are currently uh, grocery gift cards, um, in, especially in Virginia, and uh, SIM cards and cell phones um, are the, the kind of critical needs do uh, fluctuate on probably like a weekly basis at this point. Um, so we'll continue to keep the website updated with, with the most urgent needs. Um, uh, folks are welcome to drop off uh, in-kind donations at our Hyattsville office or um, uh, the LDS Church, which is really close to our Fairfax office. We're currently kind of ferrying donations back and forth um, just due to limited storage space. So that's all on our website. Uh, and then in terms of virtual tutoring, um, with, with uh, limited funds that we have um, just through the grants that, that Kristen mentioned and through our contracts, we do um, provide funding for laptops for families. However, that often runs out. And so we, we really do rely on the community to provide laptops. So we have listed that as a, um, as a, as a need, just for seeing that um, in the next few weeks, we will have you know, uh, families asking for laptops um, just to be able to connect to services um, and then to begin connecting with volunteers. So um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And we really embrace the virtual model <laughs> in volunteering, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think Ron is going to close, but before um, before he does, if I could just ask each of our speakers to go ahead and put your email in the chat, um, because I'm sure there will be follow-up questions, um, and that way people can reach out to you at the best way possible. So yeah, I think that's a good point, Vicki, because folks in our community may want you know to get a direct answer to mobilize or. Um, and, or to ask the direct questions and be ready to move quickly in addition. But I assume you want people to follow you through your structure, fill out your forms and do all that because I'm sure you're getting a lot of requests. But uh, people also, I think, have, I think having an email accessible to them is also a, a good thing, so thank you. So first of all, um, I really just wanted to thank you from the bottom of our, our communal heart for the work that you are doing, Naomi, for the work you are doing, Kristen, and for our unexpected additional speaker, Shelby. Thank you for everything you are doing day in and day out to fulfill this important moral obligation. Um, we um, would love maybe to check in with you in another maybe month, two months or see and to see how things are going and to see where there's an assessment. Please feel free to uh, be in contact with JCRC if there's any um, things, any uh, communications or needs you want to get out to the Jewish community. And most so thank you to our speakers. Um, and I also wanted to thank the 87 of you who have gotten who got on this phone call with about 24 hours notice. Um, which really is heartwarming uh, to show how we're going to work together to try to welcome these uh, allies and, and new Americans to our nation. I like the heart. Um, and we're also um, should know that obviously we're entering the high holy day season in the Jewish community with Yom Kippur, with uh, 
Passover, excuse me, with Rosh Hashanah coming up um, in about two weeks. So it also gives our opportunity if any of our community leaders on this line in their communications or when their people are attending synagogue, whether they're virtual or whether they're in person, to talk about this in terms of mobilization for their synagogue. So again, thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, we will remain available to, uh, to you at all times and um, best of luck and we're all in this together because as they say, as we say, we, uh, every time during Passover, we too are refugees and uh, we know what it's like are in our own Jewish history to come to a, a welcoming America. So let's make sure we extend, we live our Jewish values and extend that same opportunity to the others who wait to come to our promised land. So thank you so much everybody and for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the volunteer trail.